Hello everyone, once again, I am so excited and pleased to welcome all of you at this uh, virtual event that we are hosting on NGO CSW platform in light of CSW 65. This is a special year, we are all being virtual, we are still connected because of the common goal, common mission that we all have, which is gender equality work. Uh, warm regards to everyone who's joining us from all the corners of the world and also a wonderful, wonderful thank you to all our speakers who are joining us from all the corners of the world. So this is, uh, uh, there's a brilliant lineup in the next one and a half hours that you, of speakers that you will experience. And uh, I am the, I am Suchi Gore. I am the Director of Global Engagement and Impact at the World YWCA. Um, I'm an Indian by origin and I'm right now based in Geneva where I'm working in World YWCA, which is the brilliant a uh, feminist movement, which is present in more than 100 countries from all around the world. I am a feminist and I am also raising a feminist daughter right now. So very happy to be doing this. Today's event is being hosted by World YWC and YWC Australia. So thank you so much for my colleagues from World YWC and YWC Australia for all the work they've done to host this event along with us. Um, this event titled Diversity as a Driver LGBTIQ inclusion in feminist and social movements. It is a parallel session, which is an attempt, attempt for, from us to reflect on the power of inclusion and diversity in feminist and social movements through the lens of LGBTIQ women and marginalized genders. This year on March 8th, which is International Women's Day, World YWCA uh, launched a global pledge in order to create a foundation for shared intergenerational global advocacy driving change for LGBTIQ people towards transforming power structures for gender equality. The pledge, and you know, uh, we will be sharing the link to the pledge in the chat pod, uh, is our attempt to garner support from both within and outside the World Wide WC, uh, movement to affirm and formalize a commitment to inclusion of LGBTIQ people and to com a commitment to ensure that we support their human rights. Urging people, I'm really, really keen. Please go ahead, check out the pledge and uh, sign it if you truly believe in the power of diversity and how it is critical to strengthening global movements around the world. I, uh, this particular parallel event uh, from World YWCA with our presence of more than 160 years is very, very critical step for our movement. Uh, which is based on human rights, which has been working towards the approach of inclusion and diversity by empowering leaders from all around the world. We call ourselves a, pine, a, a incubator for developing leaders, pioneers, fighters who have been smashing power structures for a long, long time. With COVID-19, and uh, we have realized that there is even a further more need to look at leadership from multiple lens, from an intersectional lens. And we recognize the need to understand in depth these aspects of inclusion and diversity, which is what we are trying to do with this parallel event as well. So uh, before we move some basic rules of the session, um, we respect all the languages, cultures, opinions, expertise, and acknowledge the institutionalized operation which exists within feminist movement. We want to keep this panel uh, very, very respectful. So please uh, keep that in mind when you are posting your uh, comments. We also share these spaces very respectfully and we come together to share our experiences of patriarchal oppression. Please be mindful of the language and terminology we use because it can have profound impact on person's identity, well-being and dignity. Uh, while I keep this in mind, I uh, want to first start by introducing our amazing lineup of panelists. Uh, and I'll go one by one and, you, uh, and maybe the panelists can come, I can unmute themselves and say hello to everyone. I want to start with Bobby. Uh, Bobby, who identifies as they and them. Bobby is joining us from Australia at We Morning Hours right now. Bobby is a senior manager at advocacy or for advocacy at YWC Australia and has spent last 15 years owning this their intersectional feminist understanding and living their authentic true self as a non-binary member of the LGBTI plus community. Bobby has expertise in social justice and policy. Uh, including gendered violence, LGBTIQ inclusion, and gender responsiveness. Uh, Bobby is, has been a, a, a very, very critical part of YWC of Australia, 
and has created the future is intersectional campaign which was uh, launched officially in CSW 63 uh, lives in Sydney right now and is originally from UK hi Bobby good morning good afternoon good evening everybody it's amazing to be here um, thank you so much from Bobby, we go to Amasai, who is originally from Fiji, but is joining us from California. Amasai is a young trans feminist um, activist who is an adamant and very, very outspoken person who adores and thrives in creating awareness and advocating on human rights, mainly on transgender rights. Uh, Amasai is a lifetime member of Rainbow Pride Foundation and was the coordinator of the transgender reference group for uh, Rainbow Pride Foundation in Fiji. Hi, Amasai. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, everyone. Yeah, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be amongst a fabulous and amazing feminists connecting from different parts of the world. And good morning from California. Awesome. So uh, I, I think one of our panelists is still trying to enter, uh, uh, but we can move on with the other person, Imungu. Imungu joins us from Kenya and is a young pan-African queer feminist from Kenya who believes in establishing equality as a natural state of being and not just a token intervention. She's got, she has garnered considerable experience as a women's rights activist and uh, over several areas with key focus on economic justice, labor rights and women's leadership. She's also one of the four diversity and inclusion champions featured in the Bridging the Gap campaign by Hivos and has equally lent her time person personally and professionally to the call for diversity and inclusion tackling biased beliefs that in particular target LGBTIQ people. Um, thank you so much Imungu for joining us. Thank you for having me and it's night for me here in Nairobi, but I made the time I took a nap earlier so I'm good to go. Hi everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. That is amazing. And last but not the least, we have Tanya Safi, who joins us also from Australia, who, international winner of United Nations Plural Plus New York for her um, uh, animated film Trab Laws. Uh, Tanya has produced thought-provoking, entertaining, accessible, and impactful journalism videos, was hired, by Kickstart, hired to kickstart BuzzFeed's video Australia in 2015, uh, and she re relocated to Los Angeles for her expertise in producing, editing, shooting, high shareable, short and long form content for cross platforms. After working for internet and traditional media companies for 10 years, producing everything from digital entertainment and branded video to feature documentaries, Tanya is passionate about creating meaningful, worthy, memorable videos. Tanya joins us from Australia, but has experience of working all across the globe. Welcome Tanya. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. Before we start the panel, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to all the lands we are meeting on today across the world. Tanya and Bobby join us from Gadigal land, part of Eora Nation. We recognize the Aboriginal sovereignty and was never ceded, and that we have a shared responsibility to acknowledge the harm that was done to First Nations people and work towards respect and recognition. I pay my respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, their ancestors and elders, both past and present, and those online with us today, and acknowledge their continuing connection to land, sea, and community, and to the young leaders of tomorrow, as our future is in their hands. Always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Thank you so much. Bef so I, I think this is a great setup. I would want to first invite our General Secretary, Casey Harden, to come and share a few words. Casey brings 20 years of experience, has been a, a torchbearer of the YWCA movement and a testament of YWCA's mission to create spaces for young leaders uh, like this. She joined the World YWCA in 2018 as the Deputy General Secretary and in January 2019, she was appointed as the General Secretary, 15 General Secretary. Um, a very, very amazing feminist and amazing team player to work with. Uh, Casey, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Suchi. So typically, um, I would I would um, say, oh, no, I don't need to talk at the beginning of the panel. Use up um, use up that airspace, please, uh, with with more time for panelists or more of the wisdom from Suchi, for example. However, 
Um, for me, uh, this panel is really an exception because I um, think it is so relevant to not only the work of the YWCA, but a number of um, women's movements, uh, feminist movements all around the world. So I actually um, am very glad that you're letting me take up just a little bit of space to be really clear about the priority of this topic, um, I think for the YWCA movement and a lot of the networks in which we do our work. So to use a term um, uh, that Mungu offered a bit earlier, this is not a tokenist intervention, but um, from my position of leadership with the World YWCA, I wanna state really clearly that um, this was a very intentional parallel event for the YWCA to take part in as we looked at the theme of inclusion of women in decision-making and in all the spaces in which we do our work. And um, in looking at the World YWCA um, as a global women's movement, we have a lot of work to do around diversity as a driver, especially as it relates to LGBTI, LGBTIQ. We know that diversity brings strength to women's movements and the YWCA for, for decades has sought to deliver advocacy and support to diverse communities and really holding ourselves accountable to ensuring that we are representative of the communities in which we work and that we work together um, as a community or in fellowship. Um, but when we take stock of what the YWCA does today, again, we have a really important opportunity to ensure that we're approaching all diversity as a driver for our best work, our best collective work together, our most informed, relevant, creative, resilient, courageous, and brave, and smart, and I could go on, work. Um, we have with the YWCA a really strong foundation that we haven't leveraged or optimized. And that's in that as a movement in 1995 at our world council where all these fantastic, brilliant, dynamic YWCA leaders get together and talk about calls to actions or resolutions. In 1995, um, we had a resolution that, and the real kind of top line of it was that human rights were indivisible and interdependent, and that includes LGBTIQ people and affirming that we had to eliminate discrimination in all its forms. And then again, in 2015, there was another resolution that was brought forth by leadership within the movement. And in some ways, it was somewhat redundant to what had happened in 1995, but I say it was a call and it was, a, it was a bright light shown on the fact that we still weren't as inclusively, as thoroughly walking the talk around um, really diversity and inclusion as being a, a wonderful thing and protecting the human rights, the dignity, the freedom of all individuals, um, free and, and independent of, of their unique identities. So it came back up in 2015 and here we are in 2021 really embarking on this parallel session to the women um, and uh, they and he that are on this session today, regardless of your gender identity or your unique gender expression, know that right now you are a part of a burgeoning, um, really conversation and non-tokenistic intervention that I think will propel the world YWCA forward as a global movement. And for those of you that aren't part of the YWCA, I can only presume that you're going to see the same, um, some of the same opportunities, challenges, and, and validation of the work that you've been doing. So with that, welcome. And again, my great, my, my greatest gratefulness and thanks to all of, all of you that are on the panel today. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. That was wonderful. That highlights why we are here today. And um, I just want to go back to our speakers. Noses Way is finally uh, online. Thank you, Noses Way, for, for joining us from Botswana. Thank you for having me. My apologies for being so late, technical glitches and all of that. But um, good evening to everybody. I know, Imungu, you and I are on the same page about it being quite late, but hello to everybody, despite of whatever time zone you are. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited for this, and my apologies once more. 
That's okay. Noses Way is a queer uh, 26-year-old human rights lawyer who hails from Gaborone, Botswana. She is a radical intersectional feminist, a pan-Africanist, and a firm believer in women and queer folks' autonomy and inherent rights to enjoy their full set of human rights. Noses Way is currently a research officer at the Coalition of African Lesbians, an organization which is committed to advocating freedom, justice, and bodily autonomy of women in the African content continent. Thank you so much, Noses Way. All right, this is a great setup, but before we join and before we, before we dig into the deep, deeper issues of diversity and deeper issues of uh, inclusion in feminist movements, I just want to start by touching base with how the global pandemic has been for uh, all of our panelists and, you know, in your experience, and with your activism, what is it that we are missing as an integral part of the COVID-19 recovery that's happening all around the world? Uh, we will, I just want to touch base on this and, and, and maybe give space to everyone to share what they feel about the experiences and the activism and what's missing uh, from the recovery initiatives that are being taken. And maybe we can start with Noses Way. Thanks, Suchi. Um, so I think I think what's important to really highlight is is just how devastating the pandemic has been, right? It's been absolutely devastating across the board. And I think from a more activist and from a more work perspective, it's definitely changed sort of the trajectory of the way in which we work. For example, in my capacity at Cal, the work is research, and I definitely am a believer in a more interactive type of research where we're able to meet in person with people to get really true perspectives so that when we then go back and write the reports, the toolkit is informed by real lived, experience, lived experiences, right? But nobody's going anywhere with COVID, right? So that's definitely changed the trajectory of the way in which we've been able to mobilize and the activism exactly in exactly in the workplace has definitely taken on a different toll. But to sort of answer the more specific question in terms of what I've felt has been lacking in the various responses that we've seen, I would say that I have two things in particular that I've been liking, which I'll touch on both briefly. But the first is the lack of feminist leadership and approach towards tackling them. And secondly, that there's been a lack of a concerted effort in terms of managing the inevitable effects of COVID on the well being of those that are most marginalized, right? Those that are on the margins, queer women, poor women, right? And for us at Cal, knowing that our strategy and our sort of perspective on things is using our five plus one factor, which which understands that for us to exist, we're all at the meeting of these intersections, right? We're at the intersection of patriarchy, of the economy, of militarization. And so, all of those things have in responses that we've seen by government and states and even other NGOs and those within the human rights spaces, there's been a genuine lack of that. And so I'll just touch on with that in a minute, just to expand in terms of that. So we haven't seen a response that caters specifically to the heightened needs of those that are most vulnerable. Like I said, those that are on the margins, right? So if you have an instance where we're constantly being told that hospitals are inundated with COVID cases, what does that mean for sexual reproductive health rights? If I can't go and access my rights, which were already scanty before, because given the perception of people, like given the way in which people are treated because of their sexual orientation and gender expression, already now, if you add a pandemic in the mix, it's definitely, you know, quite the challenge. But then also what we see, especially on the continent, is that a lot of the task forces that are set up to deal with COVID don't have the requisite representation. For example, in my country, it's five men that are on that panel. And so there's not representation, right? Which means there's no inclusion. And so I think for me, those two, like that would be one aspect. And the second one, of course, like I said, is well-being. We're not talking about what this is having on the impact of the work in terms of being social movement people, um, human rights defenders. What does that mean for our mental well-being to be hit by a pandemic, to have the fear of loss of jobs, losing families, right? So I would say from my perspective, those two, a lack of feminist leadership and 
a lack of a concerted effort towards understanding the effects that COVID-19 has on our well-being as already disenfranchised and marginalized people. Oh, that was that was quite quite something. I think I think it is very very critical to what what you mentioned that the response was being done by five people. I think I, that stays with you because that's like the reality globally. Amasai, maybe you can touch base upon and share briefly as to how pandemic and activism has been for you. And I know that you are you are an activist who's doing work all across the globe. So. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, before I start, I also would like to acknowledge um, uh, feminists and activists, uh, those of us that are here, and those that have left, and those that have yet to come. There will be plenty of us, and which means there's going to be um, ensuring that we continue to all do the the great work. Yeah. So it's been a um, it's been a challenging year having to move from Fiji here to America um, in the midst of uh, the pandemic. And for me, it's been also challenging knowing that um, the struggle has become real, um, knowing that for someone who's just moved to America, um, the struggle of having to, to look for employment, but also to kind of fit in into a new community and, try and, and and having to every day negotiate how will I leave uh, being trans and being someone who's very uh, a radical feminist and having to kind of negotiate how I live as a trans, but also uh, with people I've met for the first time. And for me, and, 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 and I think activism um, it's kind of different knowing that, you know, I'm not solely um, in Fiji where I've been, you know, uh, part of everything and it's such a disconnection, but not really disconnected from the work back at home, but still connected in, in so many different ways, having to help out um, online, reviewing things and kind of, you know, engaging and kind of just giving that uh, technical advice. And to me, that's a big work. And, you know, and also the thing about, you know, when we say about activism is that when we're disconnected, you know, it's like we're giving up, um, you're giving up the baton to someone else to continue the work. So for me, activism is not about, you know, handing over. It's not about handing over that baton to someone else that, that you're no longer there physically. But to me is like I say, and, and I like to always quote Audre Lord is activism is the rent we pay for living on this earth and we get to do it differently in different spaces. And COVID has taught, taught me a lot of lesson. One thing is right now it's hard for a transgender woman like me from Fiji to access um, hormonal, um, hormonal therapy treatment first and to kind of connect back to, to LGBT community here in America first, uh, knowing that there are, you know, there are ter territories that for new B coming into, into California, wanting to join LGBT organizations, but then I've tried. But to me, it's also this kind of work that we have here, these platforms, uh, knowing that, you know, feminist sisters around the world will still want you to participate and engage in different spaces. And for me, that's solidarity. And thank you, YWCA, for taking this initiative to start this uncomfortable conversation that needs to be had, even within YWCA. And I've, you know, kind of engaged with YWCA back at home in Fiji and knowing that there are changes happening. And I'm very grateful to see a very long, uh, a, a very good friend, Tara Steela Bradbury, who is now the, you know, the leading director for WCA Fiji and knowing that there'll be good changes happening. And yeah, so for me, it's all, it's about challenging the new norm and having just to hustle and bustle to survive in America right now. And, but yeah, I'm, I'm to me, it's always a privilege to you know, be amongst amazing women, amazing feminists, uh, to kind of continue this conversation and to carry on 
all amazing work that we all do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amasai. I think I think it's it's uh, again the challenges you list are are many, and and we truly truly acknowledge the difference that this pandemic has made, but also how it has highlighted these these barriers that were already existing and which have gone worse during the pandemic. I think I would love to move to Bobby and get Bobby's insight, but, uh, Pacific Australia. Let's let's do that. So, uh, Bobby, what do you what do you feel? How has work been, and how has activism been, and what what is still that is missing? Yeah, thank you, Suchi. I just quickly want to say that um, uh, thank you for acknowledging that we're on Gadigal land here in Sydney, and I just want to also pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, their ancestors and elders, both past and present, and anyone online with us today. Um, I'm going to use a, a lens of just focusing on Australia for the moment, because I feel um, that we've been in an extremely privileged position in that our healthcare system hasn't been overburdened by the pandemic. Um, and although we've experienced some of the strictest lockdowns in the world um, and the closing of our borders, which means that no one is able to, able to leave or get in unless you're a celebrity. Um, but uh, as the other panelists have mentioned, COVID really has amplified social injustice that's already existed within layers of our communities. Um, and so it's not just in culture that we're seeing that amplified, but we're seeing it in the systems and power structures that it upholds as well. Um, I'm going to use an interesting lens, which is around uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and the Black Deaths in Custody movements that have been led by First Nations activists here in Australia. And they've continued to shift that public awareness that's been really driven by First Nations voices, many of them young women and people of marginalised genders on white supremacy and colonisation. And that has created a, a perfect storm. Um, if you seen any Australian media in the last few weeks, <laughs> you may have noticed that um, many people across Australia have been fed up and have had enough of violence against women um, and the patriarchy in general. And we've had tens of thousands of people um, marching and, and we have the privilege to be able to march in a COVID safe way currently uh, this week. Um, so it's been a very full on week for everyone. Um, COVID's meant the collapse of many industries here in Australia, and particularly those that are so heavily reliant on um, interaction with people, uh, such as art, the arts and hospitality. Um, but tourism is such a huge part of how we generate money here in Australia, as well as education, which is one of our biggest exports. And a lot of that impact has been seen on young people. Um, and although cities are starting to feel like they're coming back to life and, and life feels like it's, it's starting to get back to normal, even though we haven't got vaccines on the way yet, um, what we do know is that young women in particular and people of marginalised genders are likely to experience the biggest health and economic impacts of COVID-19. And this isn't just right now, this is over their lifetime. So impacts that they're feeling now, um, maybe delaying university, um, not travelling, choosing to do something else has, is going to have a ripple effect over their lives. So when we look at that, um, and as some of the panelists have mentioned, that, that access to sexual and reproductive health has been compromised, particularly for young migrant women here in Australia. And we've seen a rise in gendered violence as well. And I would normally sort of say uh, at this point that I would include people of marginalized genders, but um, we don't have any data for that, which is a spoiler alert for something else I might be talking about later on. Um, but in terms of what's missing for our recovery and response uh, here in Australia is that we know that governments can better action systemic change um, by utilizing intersectional analysis and gender responsive budgeting. Um, they choose not to. Um, we have the tools. <laughs> We've known the solutions for a really long time. And um, we really need to prioritize things like prevention and education. And when you have something like a global pandemic, if you look back over world crises over our history, we often sort of reorganize and regroup and build back better post of those events. So if we can reorganize social care, if we can tackle systemic issues in a period of post-crisis, um, governments can choose to take that. And uh, what we're seeing is digging the heels in and going back to our traditional stereotypes. So investing in uh, construction and keeping up um, many other types of different types of industries with money, um, but not tackling the root causes of a lot of these issues. Um, so while we've been extremely privileged to navigate the pandemic in the way that we have, um, it doesn't mean that we're immune to the impacts of that. Um, I haven't seen my family, for example, you know, they live in the UK um, and my sister is in the Dominican Republic and we are all separated just as many others right 
and are right now. So this collective pain of the pandemic, we all feel this. Um, but I feel extremely lucky to be able to work um, from home and be able to interact in relatively normal ways. Um, but I'm definitely missing uh, people. <laughs> and I think that's a really important thing to note here. Thank you, Suchi. Thank you. Thank you so much. And yes, we have been watching what's happening in Australia with the Women's March, very inspirational and kind of feeling jealous also because Australia seems to have handled the pandemic uh, a little better than many parts of the world, um, at least from the perspective of its spreading. Tanya, uh, your, your insights, I mean, you have a completely different sort of life with the activism and working on media and digital space. It's, it's very interesting. And I'm, I'm, we are, I, I'm sure everyone is keen to hear how, how activism has been for you. Thank you, Suchi. Um, I think Bobby really articulated the situation here in Australia. So I think I'll focus instead on um, Lebanon. My background, I'm mixed Arabic, Palestinian, Lebanese, Syrian. Um, and as someone in journalism, I of course rely very heavily on meeting with people, telling, helping uh, platform their stories. So for me, um, the most kind of brutal aspect of COVID was those stories stopping. Uh, pr prior to COVID, I was actually living in Lebanon and I was uh, featuring NGOs and change makers in Beirut and Tripoli from LGBT rights activists to animal activists, feminist groups distributing sustainable pads and um, products to refugee girls and women across Lebanon, to, to millions of, of refugee women across Lebanon. So all of that had to stop. Um, that was very hard to accept. It still is. And of course, last year, Lebanon also experienced the catastrophic Beirut explosion. While living in Sydney, I, of course, applied for an exemption to leave so I could go and assist my family and friends. Um, and that was denied by my government multiple times. So we haven't been able to leave, as Bobby explained. Um, but one of the biggest things, I guess, particularly pertaining to feminist issues that COVID has brought up for Lebanon and the Lebanese people is the kafala system, where there's about um, half a million migrant workers in Lebanon, uh, mostly of um, backgrounds from African and, and South and Southeast Asian countries, so including Ethiopia, Philippines, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. Um, the kafala system is basically a, a, a one of the world's most, uh, well, biggest human rights issues where these rights are just taken away from these women who go to Lebanon uh, for, for work and their passports are removed. They don't get paid. There are countless stories of sexual assault and physical assault from uh, their employers. And since COVID, um, of course, that put a massive financial strain on, a, on an already economically weak country. So a lot of these women and girls, mostly there, there are men too, but it is mostly a women's issue here, um, were just uh, forced out of, out of their employers' homes and onto the streets. So suddenly Lebanon saw hundreds of thousands of, of migrant workers homeless, without passports, without any form of income, and they might not have had income for six to 12 months prior to that anyway. Um, so COVID really brought that to light, I think, um, a little bit more on, on the global platform, but I still have seen a lack of um, storytelling uh, in mainstream media, which is, you know, my constant <laughs> struggle is trying to get any story to mainstream media that doesn't revolve around mainstream media. Um, but yeah, that's currently where I'm sitting is to help platform those stories that are that are just not seen and heard or otherwise understood. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, yeah, our heart bleeds for what happened uh, in Beirut and the after effects uh, are just uh, devastating. I, I want to move to Imungu and, and here, Imungu, maybe you can touch base a little bit around uh, that, this aspect, you know, and also kind of what you feel of how you, your uh, insights into how the, the recovery response hasn't been 
as it should have been. So, Imungu, over to you. Yes, thank you. Of course, a lot of the things that the other speakers have mentioned, I've also been witnessing um, as a Kenyan living in Kenya, as an African living on the continent. One of the key things, obviously, and I'd like to maybe touch on what Tanya spoke about just before me, was there are also other, there are also several Kenyan women who did work in that country who also shared videos and it hasn't made it to mainstream media. So I do share Tanya's frustration uh, with regards to that and just making sure that the stories that need to be told are heard can be a very difficult task. Um, Kenya has suffered greatly, of course, because it's a tourism heavy country and also a country that relies heavily on the export market. And one of our biggest exports is flowers and the global flower economy all but crumpled during the pandemic. And so thousands of jobs have been lost, if not hundreds of thousands of jobs in terms of the whole value chain. Of course, the tourism sector was the hardest hit and hundreds of thousands of people have lost their jobs and were suddenly without any form of income. Of course, something else that does come to mind in terms of the response to COVID-19 is many of the responses lacked an awareness of addressing intersectional inequalities. Stay at home orders, for example, meant that people who are currently on ongoing treatment, people who need to have access to the ARVs, to the ARTs, were not able to leave their homes and or have permits to go to health centers to be able to access this medication. People who are quarantined at home, as we said, as we spoke about the shadow pandemic, people who are quarantined at home with their abusers. And also people who need to go to work every day to earn a living. There weren't any measures in place by several governments to address this. It was more of like stay at home, but not really thinking about how will these people eat? How will they survive? How will their livelihoods be taken care of? Something else that I'd like to also mention that Bobby spoke about earlier is obviously a complete lack of good gender disaggregated data. And in some places, no data at all. Totalitarian governments, of course, have taken this opportunity to be very mum over the number of COVID deaths, over new infections, and some countries really, you cannot find any data depending on the policies of the government. And if you don't have the data, we can't design interventions, we can't reach the people who need to be reached so that we're able to help them. So that was a key missing point in terms of how we address this pandemic. And also, as had been mentioned earlier by Nosizwe, is a lack of holistic care. The conversation around the mental health impacts of the pandemic came much later, uh, once we were deep into lockdown, once we had people you know, calling in and, and just really sharing their frustrations. So that's something that should have been a conversation from the get-go, a form of holistic care that's able to take care of everyone's needs, both physical, mental, and otherwise. In terms of the recovery, I find that now we don't even have a gendered vaccine response, which I think will be important moving forward. A gendered vaccine response that takes into account everyone who will probably take this vaccine and how it shall be administered to them in reference to their current situation, the bodies that they're in, other conditions that may affect how the vaccine um, affects their bodies. Something else that I think has been missing is recovery plans are not taking into account the deep-seated vulnerabilities that have been exposed through this pandemic. We sort of think of the pandemic as a short transient event, and we are trying very hard to press the reset button and go back to what life was in a capitalist society that does not care about us, but cares only about us as tools of work and tools of profit. And our recovery plans don't seem to indicate that we want to do anything different. And I think that's a key loophole. Finally, a feminist recovery plan with represented representative leadership at all levels is missing. We are sort of constituting the same teams we have been constituting ever before that don't have the necessary voices that are needed to really build back better if that's what we want to do. As uh, Nozizwe, my colleague from Botswana had mentioned is, if you have a team of only five men leading a task force on COVID-19 response and recovery, you're very likely to miss out on important voices of some of the people who've been worst hit by this pandemic. So for me, those are the key points of what's missing and the lessons that we are pretty much yet to learn. And I hope that the next pandemic does not catch us flat-footed. 
Thank you so much, Imungo. I think all these insights have just showcased the the how exacer how the the pandemic has just highlighted these inequalities even further and further, and and things which were not being spoken about because they were not that visible. I I'm that gives me hope that at least now we can actively advocate about those because we are fighting for data and information. And, and I have to say, you all are doing a wonderful job in each of your space in making that happen. Um, I, I want to now dig a little deeper on the topic of discussion that we have today, which is uh, how diversity is a driver when we are talking about inclusion in feminist movements in social movements, particularly LGBTIQ inclusion in feminist and social movements. And as we do that, I really want to start with Amasai and because Amasai touched upon the journey of moving from, from Fiji to California during the pandemic, but also the fact that Fiji has been in climate crisis for a long, long time. And, and there is cyclone, the cyclones, constant cyclones and constant disasters that have been there. And this journey of moving to a different country and yet being connected to the LGBTIQ movement, to the feminist movement in Fiji, how is it different, Amasai? I, tell us a little bit more about what you were mentioning and what are, what are the similarities and what are the differences and how has the movement and just this, this shift been challenging for you as an individual? Also, I would love to hear what is that's keeping you hopeful, you know, because feminist movement in Fiji versus now in feminist movements in USA, they are very different and, and they're so much similar in, in, in many ways. But what is it, how, how has this been for you? Thank you. So yes, so Fiji in the Pacific region, are really uh, facing the the you know the the effects of climate change and and and, and cyclones. Recently, Fiji is still recovering from two biggest, most devastating uh, uh, tropical cyclone that hit Fiji back to back, one after another. And what I know of is that uh, LGBT organizations and, you know, uh, movements are mobilizing back home in ensuring that members of the LGBT community are, are looked after. And uh, cu currently the organization that I'm part of, Remember Pride Foundation, uh, have been reaching out to members around uh, LGBT people around Fiji. Um, you know, making sure that they that they have food and making sure that they are safe in their villages or in their settlements or where they or where, or where they live, and also Diva for Equality, um, an amazing uh, LBT feminist organization that are you know mobilizing uh, within Fiji. And you know, one of the things that um, that has become an outbreaking uh, work is that Remember Pride Foundation a few years ago launched a uh, first ever um, report, a uh, research study on, you know, experiences of LGBTQI people post-disaster, pre-disaster, and even climate change. It, it's called Building uh, Bridges, uh, where we talked about the experiences of LGBTQI people were constantly in Fiji whenever after a cyclone hits, LGBTQI people are continuously blamed for the effects of cyclone. LGBTQI people are blamed for the causes of climate change. And for us, this research has brought about the reason why we need to have uncomfortable conversation and, and, and to also have you know disruptive conversation, but with but to have it with so much love. And through this research, now we're able to sit with faith-based organization to kind of change the narrative of how they give sermons, the, the way that they preach, the way that they center LGBTQI people for the reasons that climate change and disaster is hitting Fiji, but they are not looking at the way we as human beings look after the way we live around, you know, the way we take, a, take care of the environment. And, you know, for me, it's a big move um, here and continuously connected through Facebook, 
just kind of seeing the, you know, the amazing work that continues to happen, even to, you know, to see young folks come out to support the movement and to see young transgender women, you know, are starting to be part of organizations, starting to, to be part of campaigns. And I'm fine. And I'm always happy about the feminist movement in Fiji because now that we're able to sit on the same table and to have real conversation that is important, but to also have it in a way where, where we're having it, you know, thinking about, you know, our, our own realities and, and, and it's important, but to also have, you know, solidarity is important and having it as the foundation of how we see diversity. Diversity means a lot of things, you know, including LGBTQI people is a lot of things. Now, here on the 65th session of the Commission on the Status of Women, change must happen. And it takes each and every one of us to, you know, to be the beacon, to be beacons of hope for every LGBTQI people and gender non-conforming folks. Because no longer. Uh, you know, it's frustrating to, you know, to kind of hear and see that, you know, another LGBT person have been killed somewhere around the world. And, you know, 2030 is just around the corner where we're going to review the sustainable development goals. I'm worried where will, you know, my people find home? Where will we find home? Especially those that are affected by climate change back in within the Pacific region, within the global South that are struggling to make things, you know, to make ends meet. And to also see, you know, especially the important as, you know, COVID-19, it reveals how many, you know, LGBTQI people live on the razor of poverty due to the workforce discrimination and also the inadequate job security. It's hard now in Fiji knowing that, you know, Bobby shared that, you know, tourism is one of the main, uh, you know, source of, you know, income for, for Fiji as well, knowing, you know, paradise, the beautiful Fiji islands. Most of LGBTQI, most of these LGBTQI people work in this hotel industry who are now unemployed. Most of them who are also flight attendants now that, you know, the borders are closed. So for me, it's, it's having to take all this in and, you know, to kind of see the realities of how, how really, you know, how real are we on this topic of diversity and inclusion of LGBTQI people, where we continue to see the rise of TERFs around the world, you know, TERFs who are being so radical about, you know, transgender women are not women. And, you know, it's problematic when we talk about solidarity within the women's movement and we don't recognize the participation, we don't recognize the involvement of transgender women and trans masculine within the women's movement. And so for me, it's, it's about accountability, it's how we hold ourselves accountable and we hold our feminist movements accountable. And to me, that's important. Once we have solidarity, real solidarity, that we know that will bring change and that will, you know, kind of cater for every LGBTQI and gender non-conforming folks. To me, that's important. And diversity is not, an, it's not just a one-off conversation, you know, and, and I know that change is happening within, you know, YWCA, go, uh, Glo World YWCA, it's being championing this issue to kind of have this unconversation that is needed for so many years. And yes, yeah, so that's for me. And also it's important that we also keep checking on each other's feminist principles and practices of the way we work with each other. And thank you. Oh, wow. Something you said, I think it will stay for me, stay with me for long, which says, let's have uncomfortable discussions with love. And, and that is so, so strong. So uh, such a powerful statement and such difficult one to, to stand by. And, and 
And yes, we need to keep checking on our feminist principles and how we are following them. I really, I, 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 I am very intrigued by what you touched upon the well-being because I know Nose's way, uh, uh, you know, has has worked, has been a part of uh, one of the well-being initiative. Nose's way, let's let's move on to you. And I really want to, from your perspective, listen that you know, the, there are present inequalities because of COVID and we have the, the way that these inequalities have shown up in the digital space, in the feminist world, in the well-being propaganda, <laughs> which we, we all know what it is, uh, is out, out there. What, according to you, is the challenge of moving digital with activism, especially when it comes to inclusion of LGBT people and, and LGBTQ people and also uh, briefly do touch upon the well-being work that you know you're doing because I think it fits very well to what Amasai was mentioning. Right. Uh, I was bobbing my head in solidarity and in absolute agreement the whole time, Amasi. You see, even COVID is holding us back from these kind of conversations. But a lot of what Amasi did say was was definitely relatable and accurate. And I think, Suchi, if you'd allow me just before I get into sort of the, the meat of the issue, I would just like to highlight um, a very pertinent and cruel and unfair thing that we're currently grappling with at the organization together with, together in coalition with our other partners where um, our comrades in the refugee camp in Kenya called Kakuma, Two of them were um, burnt, basically set alight, and they've sustained severe burn injuries. And as we speak, they're in really critical state. And so for the past 48 hours, all of us have been trying to pull resources and pull um, just help from everywhere we can to sort of want to highlight the, you know, the atrocities that are happening there because the basis of this torture and this attack on them is purely homophobia, right? Which completely goes against the UN resolution that strongly abhors and disregard and, and speaks strongly to the abolition of homophobia. And yet we're seeing it even in 2021 amidst a global pandemic such a senseless thing to do. And so if possible, we would like to just amplify their voices and their story. We've got a petition up that we would like to share widely. And there are some demands that have been made just so that we can get sort of solidarity going and just to get everybody in the loop in terms of what's going on on our continent and with our fellow queer sisters and brothers, you know? Um, and so that sort of brings us very nicely into the idea of inclusion, right? Because the whole idea of homophobia as an institutionalized thing is to say, this is who you prefer to spend your time with, to love, to have sex with, and therefore you are the other, it's an othering, right? And so I think in the way in which we've seen, in the way in which we've seen activism sort of go from a very in-person, literal, side-by-side -side thing to this online thing. And I have no qualms with that being the case, right? Because I do believe that the internet and online visibility is impeccable for movements, especially like ours who sometimes unnecessarily afforded the right channels to amplify our voices, but it's so much easier to create a Facebook group that have like-minded people with people that share your ideas and then we can get a shared solidarity statement out to say this is where we stand, right? However, the problem is that online visibility definitely brings about a different layer of discrimination that we're not quite talking about, right? And we're not even talking enough about the safety of women in particular, queer people on the internet, what guarantees do we have legally, socially that we are safe, we are safe to say what we say and that there's, I mean, they, one could say that there's freedom of speech, but is there, is there freedom after the speech, right? And so I think just to give a little bit of, of context to that, I'm sure, I'm not sure if all of us are aware with, there's a woman called Diane Re, Re, Riguara, who is a from from the Democratic Republic of Congo, and she had been vying against the president. And upon her ex expression of interest in terms of running against him, being a woman, of course, she was subjected to 
a plethora of discrimination, slut shaming, all kinds of things that women already experience in person. But now can you imagine how exacerbated that is in an online space where there isn't also accountability structures because I could go set up an account now, Suchi, and call myself Suchi Gua123 and say really disgusting things that in person would have palpable repercussions, but don't because now we're online, right? And then I think a second thing as well that poses a challenge in terms of this transfer of physical and interpersonal activism to online is just how purely latest it is. And to, to touch very nicely to um, what Amasi had mentioned about having very difficult but kind conversations. The internet and that migration is very latest because it comes from the assumption that all of us have got access to it, right? It assumes that we've got access to internet. It, it assumes that we've got access to a device that we can go on to use that. It also assumes that we're living in countries whose governments even are in support of freedom of speech and democracy, right? And that's not quite the case in, in, in Africa, right? Particularly on in, in my continent. And there was a type, some colleagues and myself did write a paper on the effects of you know, internet shutdowns and what that does for democracy. But I think if we were to really hone in into what that means for people on the margins, it's a disaster, right? Because as it is, you're already marginalized. You already don't have voice. You're already so disenfranchised. And now you're trying to get on this platform where you can try and get some things going. You can build a movement. You can show solidarity. You can take a stance, but you can't because your country has shut down the internet. What does that mean, right? And so many stories, so many things go undocumented, which is why I started off this conversation by sort of trying to foreground what's happening with the refugees in Kenya. And like I said before, can we please sort of show solidarity where we can? I will post the link in the chat box for everybody. But in totality, then the effects of all of those things as well definitely means that that's impacting our well being, right? And us at Cal, definitely last year, 2020, made us sort of really introspect to say, wait, let's pull the brakes on everything. How are we really doing in light of all of this? And so, just in terms of the work that pertains to well being, we're currently working on a well being report and a toolkit that's specifically for feminist activists on the continent to sort of one highlight what the demo, what the what the what the the landscape of well-being looks like right now you know when you say to an activist if i say to amasi right now are you well what is amasi going to say to me as a fellow activist on the continent and because we found that that information was so scanty we then had to introspect even further and say okay if we don't have the information if nobody's written about how to be well and how to continue to do the work the work during a pandemic we're going to take it upon ourselves to do it and so the report is is definitely in its final stages we will be sharing it with everybody widely once it's done but our hope is that this is the beginning of a discourse we don't want it to be a one-time event where we're saying well-being 2020 no we definitely plan on having it be a yearly thing where we can check in on the status of well-being of people on the continent particularly queer folks all of the people that meet at the intersection of our strategy and our, our, our methodology of thinking. And we hope it can be a useful tool for advocacy as well, for funders, for organizers, for individual activists, because our well being does matter. The work matters, but it doesn't surpass our well being, right? And that all gets exacerbated by how much time we're spending online, right? Because we're on this call, it's half past nine where I am, right? So it means I've been looking at the screen for how long. And so I think in a nutshell, Sushi, that's what I would say for sure that we we in an in an attempt to be to move with the times, I think I think the internet can be fantastic, but I think we definitely need to push for ways in which we can regulate it in a way that we set up accountability structures and in a way that doesn't exacerbate the further inequalities that those on the margins are already experiencing, right? So that would be me, that would be it for me, Suchi. Thank you so much. Uh, there's so much to think about. You know, one of the things that you mentioned around um, how digital spaces and trolling and 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 this has just shot up. It's something that you know young women and young leaders from our YWCA movement shared with us. Um, um, and and World YWCA did talk about safe spaces from a perspective of virtual safe spaces when the pandemic happened because we also realized 
we cannot meet physically anymore and you know there is this this huge internet space which people are using but are they truly you know using it in a safe manner so we're not just touching upon how do we practice it in feminist principles how do we talk to each other how do we practice human rights principles when we are following and using these digital systems but also in a way about when we were speaking to young leaders they had no idea about these digital safety systems and even when we were you know hosting events when we were reaching out to people we we saw this gap with corporates and how actually young people young people who were marginalized young people with limited resources were trying to use these systems so you you touched on upon it and i i truly stand in in complete support there because yes that's what even as a as a global movement we saw and the experience that we saw from our leaders also i think with the lgbtiq issues around governments uh, our 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 movement is doing some amazing work in eastern europe and some of we all know the crisis eastern europe some of the nations are also going through and they have voiced about how difficult it has been to operate as activists with internet shutdowns and especially talking about lgbtiq issues so we are we are our young leaders from eastern europe are right now running a campaign of my body my mind which touches about uh, the sexuality issues as well and they are trying their best to keep themselves safe as they do a global campaign online so i really acknowledge that fact and this is something which worldwide wca is is understanding every day as well uh, from our leaders on ground and uh, truly support you in uh, all the great work that you are doing at cal so thank you so much um i really want to move to bobby you know uh, uh, bobby uh, you've been a part of the wca movement you know how intersectional feminist values at ywc australia have been you know have been made into practice your experience from within and outside the movement have shaped your leadership and your values from your perspective what is missing from gender equality and inclusion in approaches that feminist movements around the world are not considering and i i i want to just say how grateful i am to bobby uh, for being on the panel today because bobby and i did go through a whole digital experience in the start of the pandemic so bobby over to you thanks suchi um yeah i don't think we have enough time to to talk about what uh, what we need but i'm going to i'm going to keep it as brief as i can i'm also going to make it a bit personal because the personal is political for me um and so i'm going to talk exclusively from my perspective um i'm not binary so anybody who's on the uh call today um for anyone who's unsure that means in really really simple terms that i don't identify exclusively as a man or a woman um and i can only speak about my experience and acknowledge that others have completely different paths because i'm in the ywca movement um this means that all of my work is in traditional women's space um and and my life is very similar um in my existence so i when i joined the ywca uh was still known by my previous name um i was non binary in private but not at work and i knew that being part of the ywca movement with its roots in christianity either if i showed up regardless of whether people thought i deserved to be here or not that i was going to have to lead change and my lived experience as someone who's assigned female at birth that's living their truth as a non-binary person now is also it underpinned by my privilege um seen as the outside world as a white educated woman with an english accent which is how people view me see me I refer to me in every facet of my life and i think that a lot of my journey as a non-binary person has led to understanding more about the impact of colonization and the impact on language across the world um around accepting attitudes towards gender fluidity and sexuality and that imposition of this western ideology which is my entire background in relation to sexuality and gender expression um means that you know that still having an impact on the legal and societal aspects for lgbtiq communities in countries and not just here in australia where i've had a really intimate journey with that as a member of the lgbtiq community here as someone that's lived through a process of having same sex marriage um uh past 
in the last few years, um, but also as an exclusionary practice as well. So I guess I come from a position that I, my evolving journey as an intersectional feminist um, has meant unlearning everything um, and through the labor of people of color and First Nations women. And that for me has, has meant that it's not only committing to anti-racism, it's not just about being an ally to disabled activists, sex workers, or my trans siblings. It's that knowing that if I don't do that, that whole communities are ignored simply because you don't think that we exist or that we're valued. And I guess, hello, we're here. <laughs> we're really hard to ignore. Um, and especially from a young person's perspective. And I thought, why can't we respectfully share these spaces that we've traditionally called women's spaces, particularly in the wise history? Why can't we build on that solidarity that we have between us? I don't go into a room and think about finding things that separate us. And in the Y movement, despite our backgrounds, or our experiences, I've always felt included, even if I've had to put my elbows out to do that sometimes. And really acknowledging that, that sharing our lives under patriarchal oppression and seeking gender equality is what brings us together. That's who we are. And if you don't understand that, then that's the part and that's the crux of the issue for the movement. Knowing that, and I'm using statistics that I have available to me, but um, knowing that one in three uh, Australian young people know someone who's gender conforming and knowing how long culture change takes. As Casey mentioned at the beginning, we've had resolutions brought up since 1995 and probably way, way further uh, in, uh, into the past than that. And I just don't think that we can evolve our future without respect and understanding for all people. And it really just boils it down to that too. We have to respect individuality and celebrate the visibility of transgender and, and gender diverse people in the community. And we have to have those uncomfortable conversations. Um, over the years, I do believe that YWC Australia in, in particular, its understanding of gender has evolved. Um, and that's been pushed by young people in our movements who are like, we are here. Uh, largely, we are queer and we're not going anywhere. Um, and that if you wanna be a movement in this world, there is a collision of social justice and feminist movements. That means that it's completely hard to ignore that, as Amasai said, that climate change is going to create Pacific nations um, to put, be pushed into a position where they will be climate refugees. And Australia as a country that's so close to the Pacific is going to have to recognize that and, and, and act as soon as possible. And we're all in these positions. Um, I want to acknowledge and celebrate trans activism here in Australia, and particularly um, for sister girls and brother boys who are trans people within the First Nation communities. And they thrive despite not conforming to colonial understandings of gender. And I see you and I celebrate you. And, and that's part of having a commitment to bringing that into all the spaces that we are. If we all have a commitment and uh, we're utilizing our understandings of what equity really looks like, then you have to acknowledge, see, and celebrate everyone in your community. Um, many trans people and non-binary people live really happy, healthy lives. Um, there is amazing things. I speak from a place of privilege, uh, given I'm not in a country where YWCA exists, where it's illegal to be myself. Um, so I feel extremely privileged to be able to um, walk down the street with my partner, um, engage in life and, and largely um, in the spaces that I work, be myself. Um, but there is a lot of censorship that goes on, self-censorship um, and I guess uh, the ability to understand that a lot of trans and gender diverse people are higher risk of suicide than our peers, um, that we experience greater levels of domestic violence and homelessness. And this is despite not having the data to understand that properly. And that's a really important part of, uh, of where I come from. Women's rights and human rights are a crisis. We need safety and justice for everyone. And that's a non-negotiable. So for me, turning up into the YWCA movement and feeling accepted also meant having uncomfortable conversations about these are the edges for us. There are intersecting dynamics at play everywhere we exist. Uh, gendered violence, racism, colonization, ableism, transphobia, xenophobia, discrimination against sex workers, for example, are all intertwined with gender justice. 
Um, and so there is greater complexity in addressing that gender injustice, for example. And I think I'm going to use gendered violence as a, a really good example here around um, my experience in this space has been driven by language. Uh, so I go into a meeting and you look visibly like a woman, then it's hello girls or hello women or hello everybody. Um, and that makes a difference. Um, and so introducing myself with my pronouns is something that I've got bolder at doing. Um, the organization has changed their forms, <laughs> which sounds really silly, but in a practical terms, that makes such a difference when you can tick yourself and not form and uh, not tick a box that isn't you or is somebody that used to be you, but is no longer more. So I guess what I would um, sort of bring to a close here is that consider that people exist, whether you agree that they do or not. Um, there are people on this call, I'm sure, that have questioned, you know, uh, what, what does that mean? What does that look like? And thought, thoughts about me and my identity that I would never think about yours simply because of the way that I present or the way that I interact. And I think that amplifying marginalized people's voices. Hear us, love us. We love you right back. We're very tolerant people. <laughs> we are able to um, exist and still be here every day. Um, and that you don't have to just be uh, trans inclusive or gender non-conforming inclusive. Be welcoming um, and be proud of that if you can and if it's safe to do so. Um, but my last point is that for so many people, it is not safe. And so I want to sort of utilize that safety that I have, walk into that spaces where the disguise that I have present in the way that I do, um, and use that to the advantage to break some rules around how we advocate and how we, how we make change. Um, thank you, Suchi. Thank you, Bobby. That's... I, I think one very critical thing that you touched upon was how as being an intersectional feminist means unlearning everything and multiple times. And and, and that in itself is so, so powerful uh, to think about how you evolve your own practices. And it goes back to what I must said about checking on each other and how we are practicing our feminist principles as well. So, but Yes. Oh, wow. I really want to, um, I mean, I could have heard Bobby for long. Uh, let's move to Imungu. Imungu, you know, I think when, when we were talking previously, you touched upon something where, where you were talking about COVID-19 pandemic and you were talking about inclusion and advocacy. And, and I, we all know that LGBTIQ people have always been part of feminist movement. Bobby has touched about it, how it is, it, it sometimes means pushing through elbows, sometimes mean being welcomed with open arms. They've been always part of the feminist movement. And this comes through in, I know, uh, Imungu, your passion for advocacy. Uh, let, let us hear from you and please do share with us particularly about your insights on social and feminist movements and how aspects of inclusion of LGBTIQ people from your understanding uh, uh, are showcased or not and what are the, what are the ch challenges that we are facing in social and feminist movements. Thank you, Suchi. And as you had mentioned, um, I do find that when we speak about diversity and inclusion, often we think of LGBTQ plus persons as people outside of us, outside of our movement. And then we speak about them. And in the same way that a previous panelist had mentioned that we other them. So we don't imagine that we have sat with LGBTQ plus persons in conferences. We don't imagine that we have chatted with them over biscuits and tea. We don't imagine that we have sat in the same offices with them. We imagine they're so distant and so far. And of course, this hurts the movement. Of course, I'd also argue and say that LGBTQ plus persons, are you, as you have rightfully said, have always been a part of feminist movements and have done so much work in terms of furthering the course, the course of feminist movements. Lesbian women, for example, are particularly, are particularly pivotal to the feminist movement because they are in a position where they have decentered the male gaze. And so they operate in a way where they're able to challenge patriarchal norms, to challenge what it is to be a woman in society and especially a heteronormative society. 
I could go on and talk about trans women who have also challenged and freed us from the prison of the gender binary. And so we are able to enjoy our freedoms as ourselves. And what does that look like? So LGBTQ plus persons have been pushing these conversations for a long time. And maybe we have just not recognized that. What we do do is with other them, or we think that they do exist, but they are far away from us. And we have failed to listen to their voices. We have failed to capture their voices. What we do do sometimes when we try to do a very shallow version of diversity and inclusion is to simply just substitute um, a marginal, marginalized person and, and LGBTQ plus persons into the very same spot that a person of privilege has had held. And that's simply not enough if we're not able to change the power relations, if we're not able to change mindsets. In a world that your interventions, we might be lulled into thinking that an NGO intervention is a movement, and it's not. Movements change mindsets. Movements show consistency and continuity over time. But if we have the sort of NGO approach where we have enough LGBTQ plus representation, but not really changing mindsets, that intervention ends as soon as the program funding ends. So how do we begin to think about really changing mindsets as opposed to just having temporary interventions and not co-opting the language of diversity and inclusion, but leaving the truth of being inclusive feminist movements. Um, well, I'm a musician and I'm a classically trained musician. And for us, a movement isn't complete if the melodies written, written for each instrument are not heard. And I think a big issue that we have within the feminist movement, and I want to center in on the continental feminist movement, the Pan-African feminist movement, is we just will not sit and have the uncomfortable conversation that we need to have and listen to the people who are affected by different systems of oppression. So yes, we live in a patriarchal society and we can all say that we have been adversely affected by patriarchy, but to assume that my experience and the experience of another feminist are identical and alike is not what we should be doing. And it's the very same thing that patriarchy has done to us. Patriarchy has made women homogenous and has assumed women are all the same. There's no diversity, then there's no difference of opinion, there's no difference of culture, no difference of race. And it is in doing so that they're able to stifle the voices that we need to hear the most. Something that I would like to mention in terms of um, some of the learnings that we've had during this pandemic in terms of how to strengthen our movements is just to point out that LGBTQ plus persons are no strangers to multiple levels of oppression. As I'd mentioned earlier, one of the things that has been missing in terms of our response to the COVID-19 pandemic is an understanding of intersectional um, inequalities. But when we look at some of the responses that LGBTQ plus organizations have been able to put up, I think the greater feminist movement can learn a lot from how quickly, first of all, that queer organizations stepped up to offer holistic care to those that needed it the most. Queer organizations, queer-led, queer-ran organizations are no strangers to offering emergency care to people who need shelter. They are no strangers to offering mental health care to people who need it urgently. They are no strangers to, to paying for people's medication who are not able to access medication at one point or another because of certain circumstances in their life. There are no strangers to sheltering uh, queer persons who have run away from home because home is simply inhabitable. I'd like to just mention a couple of, of um, examples that I have collected from the continent. There was the trans and there's the trans and queer fund in Kenya that was pivotal in terms of just offering care pack packages and sometimes financial support to queer and trans persons in Kenya who had been struggling during the pandemic. There's Le Habibo. Um, it's an organization that I would believe Nozizwe would be familiar with based in Botswana. And they did a lot in terms of just even offering financial support, uh, paying for people's food, paying for their rent, people who had lost jobs, helping people to travel who weren't able to travel because they didn't have any money to travel to their homes, sheltering people who could not be at home despite the stay at home orders because home was simply inhabitable for them as a queer person in their existence. 
I'd also like to mention Shais Fuba, which is not a queer organization in and of itself, but it's a feminist collective, but with a strong queer presence. And I think at this point, I'd like to use this as sort of like a, a bit of a case study. Shais Fuba is a South African feminist collective. And because it has what we would, you know, hopefully have in all of our organizations, which is a strong, not only presence, but a strong involvement of queer leadership. They were able to put together a holistic healing or holistic healing segments every week and every other week that would address really the mental health of people going through the pandemic. Um, it's been said that the next pandemic that we are likely to face after this, after this COVID-19 pandemic is a mental health pandemic. And organizations or for collectives rather like Shahis Fuba were able to step in and address that need, which had really fallen to the back in terms of our national governments and the county governments and other local authorities. They hadn't quite thought of mental health as something that needs to be addressed. Um, there's also the Botswana Gender-Based Violence Prevention and Support Center, which came together not only with help from Lekhabibo and other queer organizations, but also involved the Ministry of Health in Botswana to just put together um, an, a response that was able to address the needs of people who were being adversely affected during the pandemic, including also being able to, uh, to give ARVs and to give ongoing medication to people living with HIV and AIDS, including queer persons living with HIV and AIDS who are not able to access healthcare simply because of the stay at home orders and not being able to acquire permits. As we know, the lockdown really, for at least for me in my country and maybe for some of the other panelists and some of the other participants on this call, the lockdown was done in a very, um, in, in a manner that akin to dictatorship. Not much was considered around one, people who do need to go to work to be able to have food, people who do need to access uh, treatment, people who are not able to stay at home because their home is where abuse tends to happen for them. So I think all in all to say that queer organizations, queer led movements, queer people know all too well what multiple levels of oppression looks, look like. Patriarchy does not operate by itself. And the larger feminist movement has so much to learn in terms of response time in terms of catering to different voices, in terms of understanding that there is not one type of response because there is not one type of struggle and there is not one type of feminist. And um, I think that's all for now that I can say about that. Thank you. Thank you, Imungo. Oh, oh wow. I, I really appreciate what you said about movements changing mindsets and you know you touched upon it you shared how that you in detail about how that's that's what we need to look at movements for rather than interventions and and uh, we we at worldwide wc very often talk about oh are we doing activities versus are we doing a process of change are we you know, because that's what movements are there for long because change takes long it's not just about intervention and and reinventing ourselves as movements um, yeah, I, I think I really, really appreciate what you uh, detailed on those elements. Tanya, moving to you, you are from Australia and have had experience in media, as we know. How does the media intersect with social justice movements, advocacy, and has this impacted your personal journey, shaping your life, your activism, and professional choices? I know Nozizwe mentioned a little bit about how these stories don't come up in, 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 in media, and you all also touched upon it previously. So over to you, keen to hear from your side. Yeah, I've, there are so many layers to that, Suchi. I think that the digital landscape is offering and, and has offered a space where we can share stories for the very first time. That I see the internet as a tool, you know, people use it to build or to break. And it has allowed platforms to, to exist uh, where hosts like myself, who like I'm, I'm a queer Arabic person, 
uh, suddenly I was able to host hundreds of YouTube and Facebook and IGTV videos, whereas there was no chance I would have been given that opportunity otherwise, or to go to Lebanon and, and, and tell those stories. Um, but in terms of, I, I want to kind of uh, rewind a little bit, we, we touched on the lack of uh, protection when you are vocal online. Um, I've also been the subject of uh, so much online harassment um, simply because I was uh, labelled a feminist online. So suddenly I um, actually had a YouTuber who has a massive platform, a man, create a video and it amounts, amounted to 12 million views worldwide, labeling me as a feminazi. It put my life in danger. It put my partner, my wife's life in danger. The online world still hasn't quite understood that, uh, you know, the dangers online permeate. They, they are offline as well. If you're recognizable, if, if something has been seen one to 12 million times, you're not, you're not actually safe anymore. And there is no protection, I feel, for women. The, to go to the police, you have to have a, a credible um, you know, uh, threat, uh, a credible um, evidence. Um, something like a video, <laughs> once again, with 12 million views isn't justifiable enough for the police to issue any kind of protection for you as a woman or as a queer person or as a person of colour. And most of the hate that I was subject to was extremely racist, was extremely homophobic. Um, so that, that it is very layered. And speaking, I think, purely as someone living in so-called Australia, there has been a rise in the amount of TERFs that we are seeing. And I, I just want to say very quickly for those who don't know, TERF is an acronym uh, for trans exclusionary radical feminists and um, or uh, gender critical feminists. So basically there's um, what I feel is a huge divide. I can only speak from personal experience here, but there is a huge divide in the feminist movement and in media where you are either a feminist or you're, you're a turf or you're somewhere in between. And um, it's kind of somehow it feels like we're 10 to 20 years behind in this country sometimes. <laughs> um, I think though at the same time, we're speaking from a land that was colonized only a couple of hundred years ago, a land where people fight more for their own freedom than they do for the rights of First, First Nations people. Um, and so that there's a lot of groundwork to do when it comes to empathy. You know, I think like Bobby, you were saying essentially, not to paraphrase you, but yes, just accept us, we're here. But I think people need to learn how to crawl first. And, you know, we're, we're kind of expecting people to get to point 10 and, and run with our movement and, and be allies. But I think where it begins is really seeing that our struggles are shared. It's not rocket science. It's not, it's not that hard to act with kindness and to build a, a kinder world and, and to protect each other. But I feel the divide here in so-called Australia is that feminism is still trying to protect itself and it's become so isolated and it sees gender non-binary people or transgender people as a threat to that. We recently had, I think, a perfect example. You might, you might have heard, Bobby. We have a space in Sydney called the Coogee Women's Baths. It is a safe space for, uh, for women or what was supposed to be for people who identify as, as women or gender non-binary to go and swim in a rock pool. It's in the iconic part of Sydney, Coogee. I used to go there all the time with my friends. It's a, it's a space where you could um, swim with very little clothes on and, and feel safe. And it was very queer. Lots of Muslim women would go and feel safe there. Um, they suddenly came out with a, a law that basically excluded transgender people from entering Coogee women's baths. And it was because the committee is largely run by um, an older generation um, that, that's, true but it, there, there were some young members but an older generation of TERFs 
who said, you know, we're, we're sick of this confusing non-gender, non like who are they, what are they doing? We need to make sure that everyone who enters this space is a woman. And this is Sydney 2021. This is last month where we're still having these conversations about a rock pool that, that was built on stolen land that is not owned by white people period, that they are trying to claim as, as their own and exclusively for, for women, for people with the anatomy of a woman and, and almost suggested that they would check people's bodies. So there were massive rallies, of course. This was fantastic um, to see the response from, from the people from our community here. The LGBTIQA community was outraged and very vocal about that and the, the fight was strong. Um, also though, at the same time, I kind of wished that uh, the focus was on the fact that this is not white people's land. Um, I think that again, learning to crawl, you know, we need to understand the history of the land that we're on to be full people, to have full empathy, to have full understanding to be able to strive together for, for a free space for everyone. And um, yeah, it can be extremely frustrating at times, but hopefully, you know, I can only hope that we are getting there and that people are becoming more aware. It's amazing to see the, the generation, you know, I'm 32. To, so to see like young people in their twenties talking about this and having language that I never had is, is so beautiful. Uh, on many levels, I wish I had that at the time, but I'm, I'm so thankful that they do and that they're fighting and they're so vocal and visible in media and they have platforms that we could have never dreamed of. So I can only give, um, yeah, have faith in that, that it will continue. Thank you so much, Tanya. That's, um, um, that's really, really uh insightful and, and very interesting to still know about that these things are happening and, and truly I mean I haven't read about it maybe I should check more you know media but I feel like that element of all oh, these stories are not being reported honestly is also big big uh, uh, discussion. Um, I, I'm i very keen to touch base a little bit more with each panelist. I'm also mindful that Amasai has to leave uh, uh, soon so maybe we can start with Amasai if you're still there. Uh, on on one topic as to what is most critical element in leading successful feminist movements uh, which are truly inclusive what in is your hope for the future what can people do to today to make their corner in their movement more inclusive of lgbtiq people what is that one thing and in, if you have to be brief like what is that one thing Well, for me, it's really, it's just about being real. Let's be real with each other. If we, you know, if we, if we don't have a continuous conversation about, you know, human rights for LGBTQ people, and we continue to see that human rights for LGBT, LGBTQI people continue to be bargaining chip, you know, for how we as organizations and how state use it, you know, in a way to kind of negotiate things their way in. And for me, it's also about how do we also, you know, as feminists act and reflect on, on the way that we work, but very important, you know, in this very difficult times with this pandemic and having, you know, do you even hear what Tanya said is, it's really frustrating to see in the year 2021, we're still having this, you know, conversations about how and why trans people or general conforming folks should be part of the feminist movement. And, you know, and what we believe is that feminist movement, you know, it's the feminist movement is a it's about celebrating each other's, you know, achievement. It's about celebrating diverse women's bodies. It's about, you know, bodily autonomy and integrity. It's about, you know, self-care, very important, you know, and, and, and how do we take care of each other? And so for me, it's, you know, to every young feminist, diverse feminist there out there in the world is never give up, never give up that 
beacon of light that continues to shine, never give up on, you know, fighting for what you know that's right. And, you know, being the voice is, being the voice for those that are yet to come. And I would like to thank each and every one of you, the panelists, YW, the world Y, for having such important conversation here, uh, uh, you know, on the 65th session of, of CSW. And it's so nice to always reconnect with you all. And yeah, so for me, it's, you know, and I also would like to ask our World Wide WCA to kind of engage with, you know, organizations to take part on the UPR reporting, very important and critical, where we need to keep reporting at the UPR to hold states accountable to their promises. Right now in Fiji, there's a police bill being tabled where, to, to explain what it is, is that the police have the full authority to take all your phone, your laptop, and just log into it without, you know, without your approval. They have the full right to do that. So they have, you, you, well, you have to give your password and everything to them to log into your accounts and see what you have. So right now, that's, you know, it's a big human rights violation with Fiji. Now, the chair of the Human Rights Council, it's frustrating to see that, you know, this is still happening. And overall, thank you so much. And I wish you all good health and hope to stay connected uh, with, with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Amasai. Um, uh, we, we have been having some uh, unfriendly comments because of which we have removed the uh, person. As we started this event, we had mentioned very quickly, very strongly that this is a friendly space. So uh, I have taken the, the liberty of removing the person and I apologize for uh, such inconvenience. Okay, maybe we move to some, I, I think, I think Amasai talks about it in a very, very positive light and very, very critical element. And Bobby, I truly want you to reflect on what Amasai said and share your insights into, you know, what is the hope for the future? Yeah, thank you, Suchi. And I'm just going to speak to some of the comments I saw, because I think that it's important, even though we've removed them, we can still talk about them. Um, language. Thank you for bringing that up because it's actually a really great segue. Um, language matters. And um, despite labeling myself or any of my other trans and gender non-conforming people uh, as adult human females, um, it's just simply not, it's not gonna fly anymore. I think that that's probably where, where I come from. So I'm gonna spill the tea. Um, language matters. Commitment to intersectional feminism matters. Um, being open-hearted matters. Listening to young people and realizing that they are shaping the world that we have before us is, is important. And it's something that we've seen through the 160 years that the World YWCA has been in existence. It has evolved, it has changed, it will continue to evolve, it will continue to change. And I guess our responsibility now is to do what we can to share those stories in a safe way. Um, create those safe spaces and go from being just inclusionary to welcoming and celebratory. Um, partnering with LGBTIQ organizations is a really critical factor. And I think Imungo uh, spoke to that before. It's, it's critical to how we connect and, and, and evolve together. And I think leading with compassion with that empathy and the dash of the bold that we know that why women globally are tapped into is something that really brings me to the movement and, and keeps me here and, and keeps me helping growing and evolving with it. Um, the patriarchal enforced notion that gender is binary or the most normal or natural state of being is just not true. <laughs> um, LGBTIQ people, women and people of marginalized gender are likely to experience intersecting different oppressions at different times through these structures that are largely cisgendered, uh, able and heterosexual women. Um, but the oppression stems from the same patriarchal system. Um, and that's something that we can all identify. So listening to one another um, in this extremely personal and painful fear and rage driven space and to still come to that space with an open heart is a commitment that some of us just have to make. 
my understanding, <laughs> just to um, counteract any of the, the uh, messages that we're seeing in the chat, is that gender isn't binary, and it never has been. Um, any possible biological, psychological, or social measure that you have, or sex or gender, I can guarantee is incorrect. It is not the easiest way or even the right way to divide people into male and female even if we talk about biological sex in the in the world that is not something that determines who you are so for me personally uh that gender binary didn't feel right i never felt that i could be myself in those spaces i was educated in a girls school and I am so thankful and grateful for the powerful women that have been able to shape and evolve me. And I have, I'm really, really blessed with so many um, mentors in this space. But one mentor that I never had was a gender non-conforming person. And so a lot of what I'm doing in the movement is, is at, um, with, with my blinkers on to think, well, I can do, we can work within this space and we can, we can do this together. Um, but it involves having it a bit of a protection shell around me and not going online, as Tanya mentioned. Uh, I was on Twitter once. I'm on Twitter again um, and I'm doing OK this time around. But I think the world changed <laughs> uh, while I was away from Twitter, which I'm quite thankful for. But it doesn't mean that it gives me a level of protection. Um, I will often go on private on um, most social media, and which is hard for this job as well, because wanting to connect with people around the world, but then having a layer of security and protection uh, puts put a distance and a barrier between us. So for me, adopting a name that felt like a better fit, it was actually bestowed upon me, um, and a pronoun that I feel comfortable with that makes me feel like I am here. And I won't use the term preferred pronoun because it's not my preferred pronoun, it's just my pronoun. Um, and that has made my life awesome. Does it mean that I haven't had the weirdest conversations at work in normal life? Does it mean I haven't answered questions that are completely inappropriate um, through to the underwear that I wear? Not appropriate, <laughs> but it comes up time and time again. Um, and I think for, for me that the, the idea of mental health and sexual violence and sexual and reproductive health rights and homelessness and understanding the disproportionate impact on people in my community, especially young people, means that as a youth movement, in particular, I'm talking about YWCA here, uh, we cannot ignore, you just cannot ignore this. So I guess um, sort of what I'm hoping people take back into their spaces today is to understand that there are not many visible leaders, especially in the gender non-conforming space. And as we've seen today, that rhetoric from TERFs, which is uh, not a slur, it's, uh, it actually uses the word feminist in its title, which I personally don't think is correct either. I don't believe that they are feminist. And um, because you are either intersectional or you are not feminist. If we want equality and equity, and also I probably just want to quickly here link that trans exclusionary feminism is also highly linked to sex worker exclusionary feminism and putting people lower than you because of what they are or what they do. That's not feminism. Nobody taught me that. You have learned that and you are continuing to perpetuate that. So one of the, our hardest struggles at YWCA Australia is no longer men's rights activists, and I'm going to touch wood because I don't want them to come back anytime soon. Um, but we're not, we, we, we still get it and we still experience it. But the, as Tanya mentioned before, this real resurgence of, I'm going to say that it, it's largely um, older feminists um, and that intergenerational break is, is there, um, is that the, the, the pushback to that is to make me feel less than. Uh, or say that I am wrong about how I choose to identify or uses a Western ideology, which is this colonial idea that gender is binary. It's not, it never has been. Um, read a book, look at some history, connect with the Fafayin, look at other people across the world that identify in different ways and acknowledge that we simply put that on others. Um, and that means that we are now responsible for taking that back and taking the burden and labor away from trans women in particular to have to fight for who they are. Trans women are women, it's in the title. We don't need to label it anything else. We don't need to put an X anywhere. It is simply trans women are women. And once you accept that, once you move past that, 
once you realize that we all have a right to be here and on this planet together uh, and work together for a better future, it just makes life so much better and more hopeful. And um, I want to thank just in particular, Suchi, I just want to give you a big thank you at this time because it has been uh, a really emotional journey to have to um, sort of work on this with you, with the World YWCA, knowing that there are so many YWCAs that exist where I could not have this platform. And it's only people like you and Casey and others who um, not only keep that door open, but invite me in and invite us in and invite others in and say this space that we occupy together is special and it's one that needs to evolve um, but we we respect you and we we take everything that you know and we put it at the heart of what we do and as soon as you do that and you're driven by your heart the movement changes in so many ways um, so yeah thank you for um, someone giving us the the segue to talk more about that and I'm really glad that somebody actually put a turfy comment in there because it meant that we could talk about it um, but we can't stop and we shouldn't stop. And I'm so excited to be on this journey with everybody. Thank you, Bobby. Oh, oh wow. I am mindful of time and I know there are a lot of questions in the chat pod. So if the speakers can look in the chat pod and answer them uh, by writing, that will be great because I really want to go to the other speakers. I, I really want to go to, uh, um, I want to go to Nurses Way, to uh, Imungu. I mean, it, it, I really want to hear in short, what, what is your hope for feminist movements and what is driving you uh, in this journey? And Bobby, much love to you from Geneva. <laughs> Imungu, do you want to go next or, or Nurses Way, whoever? Imungu, Imungu, yeah, please go ahead. Okay, yes, thank you. I can start. Um, I think one of my biggest hopes is that we sort of begin to become comfortable with moving away from the singular gospel of just tolerance into acceptance and uh, realizing that we need to no longer keep queer people at an arm's length, but really recognize their humanity, listen to their stories and understand their realities, even if they're different from our realities. I'd like to reflect on something that actually happened quite recently. I had been called by a client to work on something. And while I was in the room, they began, they identify as a feminist organization, but they began to speak about how in the proposal that I was supposed to do for them, that I shouldn't particularly mention that they're going to work on LGBTQ plus issues. And that struck me because <laughs> I was a queer woman in the room, but I think they look at me and they imagine that I don't look like a queer woman. I may not present like a queer woman in the way that they've been conditioned to imagine that a queer person looks like. And I think if they knew how I identify, they knew my identity and who I am, that they might think differently in terms of, I exist amongst them and I, I don't have to look a particular way for you to determine what you can and cannot say around me. So these conversations continue to happen. However, when I spoke to this person about their personal politics versus their public politics, their public politics is very funding leaning. And when they're in public, they say certain things that seem progressive. They co-opt the language of what a feminist should be and what a feminist should believe in. But then in private, they do not hold those beliefs. And I think that takes me back to my point that movements change mindsets and we need to co continuously remember that it's not just about parading the language it's not just about writing good proposals and writing good posters and good flyers but also having that internal change that's quite necessary what i do hope also for the future is for us to understand that truly inclusive feminist movements demand that we unravel old package knowledge that we have been conditioned to think and really embrace that we do not have the full experience of being a woman, being a human being, being whatever sort of person you are. We do not have that full experience and someone else has experienced something that you have not experienced. And how do we open our ears and open our hearts to learn that? Because true feminism is empathetic. True feminism sees the other person's struggle even if it's not your own personal struggle. And also realizing that our collective liberation lies in addressing the most complex inequalities faced by the most marginalized of us. If the trans woman who's living with a disability is able to access her full rights, it goes without saying 
that most of us will be able to access our full rights. And once we notice and we realize that our collective freedom, the key to our collective freedom is actually in each other's hands, then we can work together towards building a movement where we recognize that this person alongside me is really in the same fight as, as I am. And I think something that can go a long way in terms of changing our private spaces is being able to have difficult conversations as has been mentioned by all the other panelists, but also sort of changing our mindset into not thinking that discussing the realities of queer persons is a controversial conversation. It's not controversial. My existence, the existence of all the panelists here, the existence of all the participants is not a controversial issue. It demands to be seen, it demands to be addressed, it demands to be recognized. And we simply cannot be blind to that reality. And also just always asking questions. One of the things that feminist movements are supposed to do is to reclaim power, to shift power, and often to dismantle power. Our job is not to claim power only for ourselves. We also have the role of redistributing power. But what I do find in some of the more um, some of the tough movements is that they intend to claim power for reclaim, shift, or destroy power structures. And I think we really need to reflect on what is our feminist mission and how do we best stay true to our feminist mission and by including every single voice, no matter how many they are, we are going to move with everyone. So um, I think that's, that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Mungu. Oh, so much to reflect on. People have been sharing that same same uh, uh, feeling on the chat board. If you would love to read, I uh, I'm mindful we have another five seven minutes. So first, I want to go to Nozizwe. Nozizwe, in short, what do you feel? The same question. I we really want to hear your voice. Thanks, Suji. Um, so I'll try to keep it succinct. As succinct as this conversation can be right. Yes, and, and just like, to just to add, we also have uh, Tanya. So I, I really want after you to go to Tanya. So right. yeah, no, complete, yeah, I understand. Um, but I, I think that in response to the first the first of three questions about what is the critical element in leading successful successful movements is what has been reiterated by so many of the panelists, right? But just this notion of feminist and social justice movements needing to be truly intersectional, right? And not having this word take on this, this sort of possibility of it being a tagline or because it's edgy and commercial to say it, but the true essence of what intersectionality means. And I think for us at Cal, we've definitely sort of understood that intersection to mean that we're aware that the people that we deal with on a daily basis, the people whose lives matter so much to us are definitely impacted by patriarchy and heteronormativity, militariz militarization, extremism, you know, globalization and environmental degradation. And why, and that's what we've termed the five plus one factor for us. And it was very much borrowed from the Women's Rights Defenders International Coalition. The, as the last part was the plus one aspect of it is the, the the degradation of the environment, which is what I think tied really intimately with what was spoken about before in terms of the effects of land and the historical aspects and what colonialism looks like for feminism in this present day, right? But lastly, I think secondly, also, I think a critical element in having true inclusive and, and just movements is research. And I think research in, in, in a way that is really spoken about really is at the core of restoring inclusivity, right? Because it then says, we know all the books have been written by historically white, male, cishet, you know, religious, like the quintessential person that has been deemed to be normative, right? And I think it's important with research to then counter that perceptive, counter that belief, and instead say, hey, here are our voices, here's what we are, this is what we're doing, and in turn, documenting our stories, producing knowledge about ourselves, and what that does is also then provide solutions to our own problem, which is a very Pan-African notion that we, we strive to, to attain all the time, right? And I think 
I wouldn't, I, I would like to say that we're, we're sort of trying to walk the talk at Cal in terms of recentering and foregrounding those very same people we speak about, right? In the various work that we've done, we've produced a report on uh, violence against women and women's political participation. And that really unearthed all the ways in which women and queer folks on the continent have been excluded from political participation and the violence in which they sustain across the board, including online violence, like I mentioned earlier. I already spoke to the well-being report as well. And I think in future things that people can look out from us is sort of an autonomy scorecard in terms of just to assess on the continent, what does autonomy look like? What does it mean? which countries are faring better than others? What can we do better? What can we learn from the next country, right? As well as an abortion advocacy strategy, because we really feel like it's, even amidst a pandemic, it's important to give back and enforce sexual reproductive health rights that should be enjoyed by all. And lastly, the issue of economic justice, because that's something that we need to critically examine, the concept of money. What does that mean for us? Are we still entertaining it as a colonial construct? What does that mean once we strip it of, what, what, does, what does it mean to strip the power from money, right? But in terms of the future, Suchi, I, I really just want a, a seriously more inclusive space. And I think, again, this is being thrown around as a very, tagline commercial, catchy kind of thing that is said, right? But we have instances where institutions, human rights bodies such as the African Union who purport to be inclusive and have even passed resolutions such as 275, for example, which speaks to non-discrimination against people on the basis of their sexual orientation. And yet an organization like CAL, which is very much vested within the rights of such people, has then had their observer status revoked, right? So that does not speak to inclusivity. And so for us, we would like to see more of that real intentional concerted efforts as inclusivity. Community care, as somebody mentioned on the panel, I think it's extremely important to remember the humanity of all of what we do, right? It's not just a movement. And although for some of us, we've gone into this space sort of as work because the political is personal and you know, like there is work to be done, but it would be nice to reimagine what it looked like to do that work from a place of care and a place of sincere empathy, like has been mentioned before, and in a way that builds us, you know. Um, and in terms of what someone can do, an ordinary person, as was said before, I think it's very much important to listen. I think that's the starting point. It's important to listen to those that are affected by any plight. That's how you make a space more inclusive. And that also, that's also, in a very in a very unique way that's how you deconstruct power right and so you foreground those that necessarily aren't enjoying don't have the access to the power and saying hey let's listen to you how do you think we can fix this and we proceed with that but ultimately i just think in my own personal capacity i want queer women to be able to experience a good quality of life their human rights just be able to dance, you know, because our life is not dedicated towards this laborious thing of activism. Capitalism makes us think we're supposed to work from eight to eight and pass out. And we even say to each other, oh, I've only slept for two hours and we congratulate and say, oh, great, well done, mate, but it's not, right? And so I think ultimately my hope is that these things can be realized in a way that is equitable for those that are on the margins, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Nozizre. I, I think that's that's very critical. Tanya, I know we are running on a clock. I We have two, three minutes for you, but I have a separate question for you. What have you, what from your experiences uh, can we do to keep spaces safe, you know, uh, uh, and look at ourselves and utilize media to influence change? I think a lot of people are asking that question and you've answered some of it on, on the uh, chat board, but please, your call and then I would like to do a little wrap uh, because it has been amazing. Yeah, uh, thank you everyone and thank you Suchi. I really appreciate the support in the comment section as well really quickly and I want to say that I'm really sorry uh, for what that person said. I hope that hasn't upset anyone too much. Um, I think uh, in order to keep spaces safe, um, to put it in a nutshell, we need to see it as uh, us saving lives. It is life saving to be a supportive, kind human. 
And I would even stretch it to say, uh, even if you don't fully understand it to begin with, you have to fake it to make it to begin with, that's okay. Because at least you're opening yourself to, to learning. There are some global things that we can all recognize are awful. And that includes um, when someone is so isolated and who has been so hurt that they are removed from this world and, and we all uh, can see it, at least with youth, um, you know, in, when it comes to really upsetting things like, like suicide and self-harm, that we need to protect youth, period. Well, that, that is all youth. That is all women. That is all men. That is, that is everyone that is non-binary and everyone in between. Um, we need to ensure this kindness is, is spread in our workplaces, in our family discussions, when our friends bring things up, when in this perfect example, in this panelist here, where someone has come out with transphobic comments and there's an onslaught of support, that is life-saving. Uh, I, I don't take that for granted at all. That can really trigger someone into a very, very dark, isolated space. And to see tens of people come, come out with, with love actually rectifies that, you know, I felt really upset personally. Um, I can still be very sensitive to that uh, because that's what I'm kind of, that's all I've ever known. So to, to show your allyship, to be as vocal as possible in, in every situation, um, is monumental. Thank you so much, um, Tanya. Um, I think that's what truly safe spaces are about. It's not about just digital, it's about what we practice as human beings. And, and being human is a continuum. It's not binary, we all know that. So I really want to take this opportunity to thank everyone, including our amazing panelists. This has been enlightening, this has been amazing. We will try our best to hopefully get the recording and post it on our YouTube and share it with people uh, who have requested. And, and I at Worldwide Blue CA, I just want to say this, that we recognize women, LGBTIQ women, women with marginalized genders in all their leadership and that the, the amazing role that they are doing, they are trying to fulfill to achieve an equal future, especially after this pandemic um, and the world that we are going to live in. Today, through this panel and through the work that we are doing with the pledge, which I request everyone to go ahead and sign up for, I urge you, we all urge you to reinforce your own commitment to the strength of diversity, which diversity brings to movements. You know, let's question ourselves. Let, let's question ourselves as leaders in feminist movements. Let's question our feminism, uh, and which is not wrong in any way because that's what evolving feminism is all about. Uh, well, YWC is doing the same. We are, we are garnering support. We are trying to question. We are, we are evolving ourselves. That's why we are here. We have been here for 160 years because we have evolved as a movement. And um, I urge you all to go ahead, check out our social media, please follow us, uh, uh, check out the website, please follow these amazing speakers who have been on today. Look, at, look out for their organizations, donate to their organizations. It's, it means a lot of uh, support because if you do that, you truly are supporting the mission and vision of a gender equal world. Uh, um, it's not just about uh, attending a panel to be very honest from, from my side. But from the bottom of my heart, I, I thank each of the panelists. I thank our amazing listeners. Our work is far from done. Let us continue these conversations. Let us take critical steps to make our movements inclusive. And um, let us document and share these stories and lived realities of the diverse group of women, LGBTIQ women, marginalized genders every day. And, and I, I did not intend to take out the person initially because my mind was, oh, let, let us bring the person in the conversation, but maybe that's for another time. So uh, we have to practice different forms of activism and we continue to do that in our life every day. Thank you so much. And from everyone joining from all the parts of the world, a true, true thank you from World YWC and YWC Australia and uh, have a good CSW session. And I hope that you take the take in, immerse in all the wisdom and all the amazingness the panelists have shared. Thank you so much.